1. Um, we're going to look at uh, verses 9 through 18, Lord willing, and the church don't rise. And if it does, that'll be a whole lot better, right? <laughs> be out of here. And we don't have to worry about what the next variant is of the COVID virus and all the other stuff. Rising gas prices and food prices and everything else, right? We'll just be in heaven and, hey. But until then, we shall occupy until he comes, right? And in the, in the vein of occupying until he comes, then we need to know how we should then live, right? And so that's why we're here, right? So Philippians chapter 1, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have together and the, the time that we have that we can get into your word. And we, we praise you, Lord, that we are still living in a country where we can uh, freely meet and, and open your word and, uh, Lord, have a, a Bible study, uh, Lord, without fear uh, that, uh, that someone is going to break in the door from the government and, and put a stop to it and all. Lord, we know that that's a, that's a possibility in the future, but for now, we'll praise you and thank you and we'll take advantage of this time that we can get together. Lord, we see the things happening and know, Lord, that your return is near. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be ready. And along those lines, Lord, speak to us tonight to uh, further conform us into your image. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we ended last week uh, in verse uh, 8 with Paul telling the Philippian church how much he wanted to see him again. Now, Paul continues his letter to them, to people that he really loved. Uh, he already expressed that to them. Uh, and he continues to both exhort and encourage them. Um, and as I started looking at, uh, gosh, just last week or whatever, when I started looking at what, uh, what we were going to look at this week, uh, I, I started thinking about a phrase that uh, my buddies and I, actually a lot of Christians used it back in the mid-70s, uh, and that was the term sloppy agape. How many of you guys remember that one? Sloppy agape, right? You know, and uh, agape is the, the Greek word for love, the one that's defined in uh, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, but because of what we see in Scripture, uh, loving someone involves more than feelings or, or even unconditional approval. <laughs> That like, no matter what he or she does, it's okay. It's all right. Uh, now, I believe in unconditional love, you know, that no matter what someone does, if I love them, I'm going to love them no matter what they do. I'm going to still love them. And, and yet that won't always cause me to approve of whatever they do, right? And every good parent knows that. You love the kid, even when they're driving you nuts, even when they're doing something that they absolutely should not be doing. You don't approve of the action. You, you keep loving your, your kid. But see, just to, to approve all the time, uh, whatever someone does, that's not real love. Because if you really love someone, then you want what's best for them, right? right? I mean, that's that's pretty clear, right? And then on... To add to that, if you believe the Word of God, then you know that what is best for anyone is to live according to the Word of God. You know that if we live against God's will, that we will miss out on a lot of blessings, right? <laughs> and so you can't approve everything. You have to, as a parent especially, you have to, you know, be those guardrails to bump them back on in the right direction. You have to keep them going in the right way and train up the child in the way they should go so that when they're old, hopefully they won't depart. But this is the very thing that Paul addresses next. Look at verses 9 to 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So notice here that Paul prays for these believers, these believers that he loved, that loved him, and that had been supporting him since day one. We talked about that last time. 
And, and his prayer was that their, their love, the agape love, would still uh, it would abound more and more. And, and folks, we can always love more, right? I mean, there's always more of self that we can die to and say, no, I'm, I'm going to love like Christ loved. I'm going to give of myself and all that. But notice that Paul prayed that their ever-increasing love, if you want to call that, would be based in or upon knowledge and all discernment. One of the biggest problems that, uh, that are within uh, the church today, uh, the church universal, uh, is a lack of discernment. I'll bet you a lot of you can think of things that, oh, yeah, I've seen that kind of thing. And the word discernment, uh, the definition of the Greek word that's under that English word, means to have the capacity to perceive clearly and hence to understand the real nature of something. (laughs) Think about that. To perceive clearly and to have the ability to understand the real nature of something. Another definition is perception not only by the senses, but by the intellect. Uh, the, the old King James Version words it judgment here instead of discernment. And, and really, it's the ability to judge something, to perceive accurately whether something is really good or whether it's really bad. And, and that's the only way. I mean, you think about it, that's the only way that we could approve the things that are excellent. If you don't know what's good or bad, how can you approve What's excellent if you don't know? And in order to discern good from bad, you've you got to know what good is. You've got to know what bad is, and that's where the knowledge comes in, that our love has to grow based on knowledge, based on really knowing what's good or what's bad. So the question comes up, especially in our society today, where do you get that knowledge from? Where are you going to get the knowledge of what's good and what's bad? You're going to get it from the world? <laughs> You're going to get it, you know, from what our society says this week is good or bad, you know? And, and if you are, then which part of society are you going to get it from? You're going to get it from the far left or from the far right? You're going to get it from somebody in the center? But understand, if you get it from any of those places, <laughs> all of those things are constantly changing, especially those of us that that have some gray hair. We know about that, right? <laughs> you know, you do a little research. I was thinking about this. And if you do a little research and you see what the Democratic Party and what the Republican Party's uh, platforms were 50 or 60 years ago, you see what they stood for. You see what their, the candidates were campaigning on, what they said was right, what we need to do. Is some of the stuff is 180 degrees from where their same party is right now. You think about uh, JFK's 1961 inaugural speech. Remember the line, the most famous line in probably any inaugural speech was, and so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Can you imagine a politician saying that now? Oh, man, if, if a politician was to say that today, they would get canceled, you know, or they'd be ridiculed right out of public life, man. They would be scorned. Like, How dare you ask anything of us? You know, you're supposed to be doing everything for us kind of thing. And it, it used to be also, when you think about it, that everyone, at least in the United States, agreed that stealing, that looting was wrong, right? <laughs> you, you wake up one morning and go, what? It's not wrong anymore? <laughs> and today, I, you know, I was watching the news the other day. It, it is now a thing where they don't even want you to use the term looting because that's, that, that's, uh, that's racist to say someone is looting. <laughs> it's like, this is insane. I woke up in a parallel universe someplace, you think. But that's the way it is right now. Things change so much. Yeah. But you think about it, and this is, I, I got a point here, okay? I'm, I'm going a wrong, long way around the barn. But why have things changed so much? Why have they changed? I'll tell you why, okay? Since nobody's volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> it's because we as a nation have rejected 
the one unchanging source where we can get the knowledge of exactly what's right and what's wrong. The Word of God, the Bible. We as a society, as the United States, we've rejected the Word of God and we have accepted moral relativism. You know, that's the idea that there is no universal or absolute set of moral principles or, or moral truth. There are no absolutes, they say. Anytime when somebody tells me that, there are no absolutes. I always look at them and go, absolutely? <laughs> because that's an absolute statement that they're telling me, that there are no absolutes. And, and the people, you know, have, we, and we've been hearing it for a long time. Well, to each his own, Right? Or who am I to judge somebody if they're doing this or doing that? And so what we see playing out in our society today is a logical conclusion of that whole mindset of moral relativism. You know, it's really anarchy is what we're seeing because there, there are no absolutes. It's whatever you want to do. And if there are no absolutes, then you can't say what someone else is doing is wrong. Understand that. You, you can't say that this is wrong, like looting, you know? You can't say, hey, that's wrong that you're taking that. It doesn't belong to you. You can't go out of that store with an arm full of goods that you have not paid for. Hey, you know, I haven't been given all the opportunities that everyone else has, so I deserve this. That's what some of them are saying, that it's okay now. And you know what? That's their reality. That's their set of morals right now. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I don't think they really believe that. That's just kind of a smokescreen they're throwing out there to justify you know, the, them stealing. And somebody would ask, looking at that, well, wait, man, what happened to thou shalt not steal? <laughs> what happened to that? Well, you, you, can't, you can't say that because that's your morality, not theirs. You know, you, you, you can't impose your, your set of values onto them. And besides that, our society no longer accepts the source of truth that we would go to, the Word of God. They don't accept that. We are in our nation where Israel was a number of times within the book of Judges. Remember when we were studying there, we, we saw that they had rejected God Almighty. They rejected Yahweh and His Word. And we read a couple of times, you know, everyone did that which is right in his own eyes. And each time that was stated about them, it brought about judgment from God. And, and so we, we have to remember, we as Christians, we're not part of the world that is perishing. We have to remember what Jesus said about us being set apart by the word of God from the rest of the world. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, as he's praying to the Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God is our measuring rod. You, you might have, have uh, heard the term, the canon of Scripture. Everybody familiar with that one? You've heard people say the canon of Scripture? And, and what that means is that the, the word cannon, and it's with, with one in in the middle, not two. It's not something you shoot a cannonball out of. But in the Greek, it's spelled with a K, but it literally means a measuring rod. See, we're to use the Word of God as our measuring rod to really judge if something is good or not, if something is godly or not. Like 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, These things we also speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So we're to compare what claims to be spiritual with what we know is spiritual. And that's the Word of God. That's what we know is spiritual. We, you know, we, we have to look at what people are saying or doing or what we're thinking, what we're practicing, and compare that with what does the Word of God say. And somebody might say, well, hey, there's a lot of moral relativism within the churches today. Well, yeah, there are. There's a lot of that because so many churches have rejected the Word of God. They rejected it as being the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God, <clears throat> which I believe that it is. <laughs> 
we at Calvary Chapel, we believe that. There's many churches today that don't even believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Some will say, well, it has the Word of God in it. You know, there are places where, yeah, that might be the Word of God. And so the only way you can know is you talk with them because they're the expert, you know, not Jesus, who quoted the Old Testament time and time again and called it the Word of God, or the apostles who, who, who said it was the Word of God and, and all that. No, they're the, they're the ones that are the experts. But, folks, the Bible, the Word of God, is inerrant. That means it has no errors. In the original writings, there are no errors. It's infallible. It can't fail. It's inspired. The Bible says in, I think it's um, 1 Timothy, that it's breathed out by God. That's, that's what inspired means. And if we're going to abound still more and more and all discernment and approve all things that are excellent, we've got to study the Word of God to get the knowledge of what is good and excellent. <laughs> and then if we do that, then we can, and really, we've got to do what Paul told the church at Thessalonica to do in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. He tells us, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. We need to study the Word of God and hold on to the things that are good. Then abstain, stay away from the things that are evil, every form of evil. And after we know what's good. And after we get the knowledge uh, of what's right and wrong, the way that we'll mature spiritually is to practice what we see in the Word of God that's good and esteem uh, from what the Word of God says is evil. Like Hebrews 5.14 says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We cannot go along with the rest of the world that says, hey, do anything you want, it's okay. <clears throat> it's all good. No, it's not. There's some stuff that God says is evil. And we can't, we can't go along with somebody that's practicing evil and say, well, no, that's, that's okay. It's all good. Because it's not. We need to be practicing by reason of use what's good <clears throat> and, and discerning from, from good and evil. The result of that kind of living, Paul says, that we would be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Now, I think all of us here know what the English word sincere means, right? Genuine, honest, real, truthful, free from pretense or disease, uh, deceit, not disease. <laughs> you could be sincere and be sick. No. <laughs> it, it's free from pretense or deceit. <laughs> we understand that. Where we got our English word sincere from is kind of interesting, and it really speaks more of what God wants us to be. In the time that uh, the, the New Testament was being written, uh, you know, they had pottery shops and, and marketplaces and all where they'd sell pottery and all. Uh, and if somebody that was unscrupulous uh, was selling pottery and let's say he was making a pot and uh, he, uh, he fired it and, it and it cracked while they fired it, sometimes what they would do before they painted it or whatever in order not to have to throw away all that, that work that they had done, they would fill in the crack with wax. And then they'd paint over it, and wow, it looked perfect until you tried to use it to cook with. <laughs> you know, until you put something hot in it, the wax would melt, and you would have a mess. And so those that, that were uh, reputable, they started stamping on the bottom, sin, S-I-N, Sarah, C-E-R-A, sin Sarah, means without wax. And so, you, you know, if you trusted this guy, you know, okay, without wax. You know, if it wasn't stamped that, then it's like, okay, you might be able to use it uh, to put cold water in or put a plant of flour in or something like that, but you couldn't cook with it. But if it was sincera, oh, okay. There, it, it wasn't filled with wax. There was no hidden flaws. And, and that's what the Lord wants out of us. He wants us to be without wax. He wants to, 
really, it, it came to mean uh, when someone would see the word sincere there or sincera, it means that this thing would be found pure when examined in the light. And that's what God wants us to be. You know, that, that we would live in such a way that when we're held up to the light of God's judgment, that we would be found pure, undefiled, without any hidden flaws. <laughs> really, that when we wouldn't be a bunch of crackpots <laughs> in reality. But he wants us to be sincere. And if we're living this way, then those fruits of righteousness, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, they'll be growing in our lives. And, and we'll also discern what's excellent. We'll approve it and we'll practice it. And all of that righteousness, all of that comes through Jesus Christ. He puts in that righteousness. It's not a self-righteousness. It's not something we manufacture. It all comes from Him. Remember, we've seen that, that it's Him working in us that causes us both to do and to will, you know, to will and to do, to want to do and to be able to do what pleases Him. It all comes from Him. When we're born again, he puts his Holy Spirit inside of us and gives us now a new nature. He, he causes us to be spiritually oriented. And we're able to hear him, able to discern you know, what he is saying. The word of God starts making sense. And so the righteousness that's produced as the Holy Spirit is working in us through his word. It all comes from him. And the end result of that will be to the glory and praise of God, as Paul says here to them. See, not only will we be praising him for what he's done in our lives, and everyone here, I'm sure, can think just for a few minutes and go, oh, yeah, he's done this, he's done that, he's done that, you know, and, and hopefully you're thanking him all the time for the things that he has done and things that he is working on, the things that he's going to do and all that in your lives. But see, it won't be just us that will be glorifying God and praising God because of the work he's doing in us. The people around us will praise God and they'll glorify him for what they see he has done in us and is doing in us. You know, it's like people looking at me going, praise God, Tony's not half the jerk that he used to be. This is awesome. You know, God's so good. Now, remember, we mentioned last time that Paul was writing this from a prison house in Rome. And how Paul got there was a pretty rough way to go. And let me just give you a thumbnail sketch before we read this next part of Philippians 1. Remember, he was in the Jewish temple area, and uh, he was beaten by a Jewish mob uh, because they wrongly believed that he brought a Gentile into the inner court of the temple area. And then Roman guards had to step in. They arrested him. Uh, and then, because of a plot to kill him, uh, Paul was taken down to Caesarea to be tried by Felix the governor, where they could do a little bit better job of protecting him, too, because he was a Roman citizen, remember? And Felix wanting to do the Jews a favor and wanting to receive a bribe money from, from Paul, uh, he left Paul incarcerated for two whole years, and then he left office. And when the new governor, Festus, came in, not Marshall Dillon's buddy, but Festus, the new governor there, uh, he, he was going to send Paul back to Jerusalem where the Jews were planning on killing him. And that's when Paul appealed to Caesar. That was his right as a Roman citizen. Anytime a Roman citizen was facing a capital punishment, he could appeal to Caesar and and then they would have to let him stand before Caesar before capital punishment could be carried out. Remember, I shared with you the, uh, the last time that it was important that, that we kind of keep in mind, it's going to come up a few times, that Paul was a Roman citizen as well as the Philippian church that he was writing to because they were there in those cities that were, uh, were Roman um, I can't think of the term right now, <laughs> but uh, if, they, if you lived in one of those cities, like Paul was born in Tarsus, there in Philippi, uh, they were a Roman colony, is what, <laughs> what the word I was looking for. You were automatically a citizen of Rome, even though you weren't Roman necessarily by your lineage. So he appealed to Caesar. 
And after that, Paul was taken to Rome. But in route, remember, he had all kinds of hardships. And there was this big storm. And Paul was shipwrecked. And they had to cling to pieces of wood and all that kind of stuff to get to shore. After that, you know, he's all soaking wet. And he's building a fire. He was one of the prisoners. So he had to, to get the firewood and all that stuff. Remember, as poisonous snake bit him. And they were all waiting for him to drop dead. <laughs> no, he didn't. So they finished taking him to Rome. And that's where he was at right then as he was writing this letter. And all of that that he had suffered was for the sake of the gospel. So with that in mind, look at verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. See, when you read this, and this is really the first time it hit me like it did. When you read this, if you don't know all that happened to him, Paul's tone makes you think that he just missed a ship that was sailing to his planned destination, got stuck in a city for a couple weeks, and revival happened, you know? I want you to know, brethren, the things that which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Like, you know, if I get to go to Kenya again, and, you know, our mission team, you know, if we don't miss a plane, and, and, you know, a connecting flight, it's happened. Uh, and instead of flying, uh, you know, from, uh, I, I think it was uh, Amsterdam that we missed the plane on, we had to fly to Paris instead of straight to Nairobi. And if that happened again, and we had to go to Paris, and while we were uh, there in that waiting area, we started sharing the gospel with a crowd of people, and a bunch of people got saved. I might call Buzz up, you know, and, and give you guys an update and say, hey, tell, let the folks know. The things that it, which have happened to us have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. You kind of get that feel for what Paul is saying here. You would never guess all of the things that happened to him by the way he just just stated that, hey, you know, this stuff that's happening, I want you to know it's actually happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Awesome. But here's the thing that we got to ask. How could Paul have had such an attitude in the light of all that he had suffered? And in fact, while he's there in prison, he doesn't know if he's going to be executed. Caesar may have him put to death. How could he be like that? The thing is, Paul wasn't focused on himself. He wasn't focused on his desires, his comfort, or his will. Paul's life, and we'll see more of this next week, was all about Jesus. It was all about spreading the gospel. It was all about fulfilling the Great Commission and Paul's specific calling. And everyone around him knew that. Look at verse 13. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. <clears throat> the palace guard, uh, the Greek word is praetorium. It, very similar to our secret service. These were top Roman soldiers, centurions that were responsible for the safety and security of the emperor Caesar and for all that were in Caesar's palace. Not the one in Vegas, the, the one there in Rome at that time. I know I'm full of them tonight. Uh, but they and all the rest, Paul says, everyone that was around him. <laughs> She's going to deny, deny Mary, being married to me. Uh, you know, everyone that was around him knew why he was in prison. Not for being a criminal. Not for being a thief, a murderer, or anything like that. But they knew, they understood that it was for the cause of Christ. They could tell by his witness, by his character, by his attitude. Just like we looked at last time when Paul was in prison there in Philippi. How the whole church of Philippi started, right? <laughs> As he's there in prison after being beaten you know, without a trial. <clears throat> Him and Silas are in the prison there. They're praising God, worshiping. And we saw that all the people there were listening. They saw that. Wow, this is weird. Nobody gets beaten and then praises God. <laughs> you know, they may curse God while they're in here, licking their wounds, but nobody praises God. What's up with these guys? And it started a revival there in Philippi. But look at verse 14. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. See, because they saw Paul 
fearlessly preaching the gospel, standing for Christ, and doing what he was called to do, no matter what, and seeing his attitude, other believers were emboldened to preach the gospel as well. The gospel was furthered because of that. You know, how we handle serving Christ will affect those around us as well. Believers and unbelievers. You know, the unbelievers, they'll look at us and go, man, you're weird, but, you know, I, I want to know about this. I want to, why are you like this? How can you have joy in the midst of these circumstances? But the believers will be encouraged too. They'll be encouraged if they see how we serve the Lord, if we're serving like Christ did. You know, do we give up when the going gets tough? Or do we continue to serve? Setting an example. You know, an example, really, of faithfulness. I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what. Look at verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. See, Paul being in chains emboldened two different groups of people to preach the gospel. And don't miss this. According to verse 14, you go back and look at that, both groups were brethren in the Lord. Don't miss that. They're saved people. They're brothers in the Lord. One group was preaching Christ out of, of love for Christ and really out of love for Paul too. Hey Amen. This is what Paul would want us to do. This is the very reason he's in chains right now. You know, if he was here right now in our place, he'd be preaching to those people. Come on, man, let's preach to them. You know, we love Paul, man, and we want to do what, what he would do in this case, man. And this is what the Lord sent us out to do. But the other group, they were preaching the gospel because they thought it would make things worse for Paul. Bizarre, huh? That brethren in the Lord would do that? <laughs> you know, they figured, well, hey, man, the more the gospel spread, the more likely Caesar would execute him or at least beat him more than if it was just, you know, kind of, well, you know, he's not causing too much of trouble. <laughs> but they went out, they were doing that, you know, so that he, he would be in more trouble, and they were brethren in the Lord. Even though, and we've seen this, we saw this in the book of Acts, we've seen it in the different letters that we have read, the different epistles, that even though it was obvious that God had sent Paul out with the correct message, and God was blessing his ministry, man, with all kinds of different signs and wonders and all that. And everything that Paul did and said could be verified by the scriptures. He could point to the Old Testament and say, look, this is what it meant by here. And this is what it meant by this back here. And this is what David meant when he said this right here. <clears throat> Even though all of that was a deal, there were some that hated Paul because, especially the legalists, the Judaizers, they thought that Gentiles should have to be circumcised and keep all the Jewish laws. And Paul opposed that vehemently. <laughs> and, and you got to understand this. And, and this is one of those things that, you know, that just it's hard to comprehend that believers in the Lord would act like this to another believer, especially to an apostle. You know, <laughs> that people with their agenda that's not God's agenda that are unwilling to be swayed by the word of God, okay, and that's important. If they're unwilling to be swayed from their agenda, from their position, even by the word of God, they will fight against those that oppose their agenda. They will hate those people even though the opposition comes from Scripture. It doesn't matter to them. They're not getting what they want, and that's what's important. It still goes on today. They're those that want to be in a church that they run. Not that they want to actually serve. Not that they want to take the time and commit to serving and, and, and all that. But, you know, they want the pastor to be like a politician, preach only things that they agree with. And, and they want to determine church policy, even though it may be totally unbiblical. They even want to choose what color the carpet's supposed to be, you know. 
They want to be in control, and if they can't, they're going to make it miserable for the pastor and for the elders, and, and they'll end up going someplace else. And, you know, when they do, okay. You know, that's okay. And I, it's, to me, there have been a number of people that have left here like that, and, you know, when I find out, well, they're going to another Bible-believing church, I think, okay, good. Maybe they'll receive from that pastor. I know he teaches the Word of God. Maybe he could get through to them. <laughs> Maybe they'll receive the Word of God from him and that. But Paul, see, he wasn't going to let their motive for preaching the gospel steal his joy. Don't miss that. He was appointed for the defense of the gospel, he said. And because it was being preached, he was happy. <laughs> Look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Folks, that's the heart of a guy who's really all about the gospel, who's really all in to pre pleasing the Lord. He's there sitting in chains. A soldier chained to him 24-7 after all the trauma of getting there to Rome. <coughs> and even while he's in there, some of his brothers are trying to make him uh, have a more miserable time, trying to make things worse for him. But he's rejoicing, and he's committed to continue to rejoice. <laughs> yes, and will rejoice. Now, I, I was thinking, what if Paul didn't have that kind of attitude? What if he gave up? What if he said, you know what, this, this, is, this stinks, man. I'm out of here. Would you and I have heard the gospel? Yeah. I mean, he was the one who brought the gospel to Europe which is where most of our ancestors were from, right? <laughs> most of us. God loves us. You know, we talked a little bit about that Sunday, right? That uh, we all have a part in the body. And just, you know, just like that, that, that God would have sent somebody else eventually. But like we said Sunday, the church would have suffered. And Paul would have missed out on a lot of rewards that he's experiencing right now. Think about that. We, we always think about, oh, eternity, that's so far off. Oh, you know, uh, the rewards in heaven and all that kind of stuff. That, that's so out there. I can't even grasp that. Paul's experiencing some of those rewards right now. He's been experiencing those rewards for about 2,000 years. And he will for another 2,000, 2 million, 2 million thousand gazillion years through eternity. He's, he's experiencing those things right now. So, you know. How, how's our attitude, you know, concerning the gospel? How's your attitude concerning the Lord in general? You know, have you stopped sharing the gospel because someone got mad at you or made fun of you? <laughs> we used to go out, first it was on Hollywood Boulevard, then it was out at Huntington Beach Pier and, and, and all that every uh, Friday night and share the gospel. And people called us all kinds of names. We got spit on, we got pushed around and all that kind of stuff. But it was awesome because we knew Hey, we're bringing the truth. God's using it. We're doing what God called us to do. Yeah. And Michael and she'd be in the band praying. <laughs> and, and, you know, but we need to, to think about this kind of stuff because, you know, eternity is right around the corner. A lot closer for some of us than others, too, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, yet we got to check ourselves and say, hey, you know, did I stop serving the Lord because it wasn't convenient? I'd maybe have to get up an extra half hour or early or something like that. You know, what, what, am I, what am I doing for the Lord, you know? Or maybe because you had some conflicts with a brother or sister, you know, that you were serving with. Oh, yes, I, 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 kind of thing and let that dissuade you. And I, I think one of the things that we've really got to ask, and we'll get into this more next time, is what is the most important thing or who's the most important person in your life? And what would you point to as evidence of that? Because I know everyone here will say, oh, well, the most important person is Jesus. Absolutely. The most important thing is the word of God and the gospel and all that. Well, what would you point to as evidence? You know, what do you do towards that? Well, for him and for the gospel. Paul, he could point to his sufferings his trials, his chains. He can point to the soldier that was on the other end of the chain. <laughs> hey, you know, my chains are in Christ. I'm appointed for the defense of the Gospels. 
And these chains are proof of that. In fact, remember when we were in 2 Corinthians, we saw him do that very thing, talking about the proof of his apostleship. And he talked about in chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 11, well, all the things that he suffered. That, that, Paul kind of wore those, those sufferings as a badge of honor. It's like, yeah, you know, this, this is my ministry. This is what I have suffered for the sake of the gospel, and I know God is going to reward me. I know I've got rewards to look forward to. And next week, Lord willing, we'll get to the rest of the chapter. Let's stand up and pray. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the exhortation and the encouragement. We pray, Lord, that we would examine ourselves and to make sure we're right in the center of your will. Lord, that we are serving you. Lord, that we are being obedient to you. Lord, that we're continuing to go to your word and see what is right and wrong. Lord, that we are holding on to what you say is good and excellent. Help us, Lord. Help us to do that even in the face of, of so much resistance that's going on in the world right now. Lord, help us. Help us having done all to stand, knowing that from you we will receive our reward. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise him with one last song before we go.